I'm going to be um, introducing our panel chair, Dr. David Rosenthal, who's the uh, Henry K. Oliver Professor of Hygiene Emeritus at Harvard University. And uh, we're so uh, delighted to have Dr. Rosenthal uh, chair this panel because he was one of the original people who brought up this concept of having a, a joint meeting between uh, the societies. And uh, so we're, he was really at the source of, 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 of this whole event. Um, so I also want to uh, mention that we have uh, a, a, an additional uh, panelist, uh, and, and Dr. Patty O'Brien, who gracefully agreed to take uh, the place of Beverly de Valois, who unfortunately had to leave uh, due to her family uh, emergency situation. Um, Dr. O'Brien is professor of medicine at University of Vermont, and she's, a, she's an internist, and she is an expert in lymphedema, and so we are just really pleased to have her on the panel. And Dr. Langevin will take her seat as one of the speakers. So I thought uh, there are two microphones, and so, but I'd first like to ask a general question uh, to all the uh, panelists and all the speakers, and that is what their initial thoughts about this conference, what they thought about the concept, and what they think about the possible next steps that you might consider after this, and to try to be brief so we can give questions and answers to the rest of the folks here as well. So Dr. Ding, do you want to start? Uh, of course. Um Really think this is Can we put on the microphone, please? I, I really think this is a wonderful event. First time the three societies come together, and the first thought I have is we should have done it way back or <laughs> more often. That's definitely true. And also what's important to me is also what the audience, you guys, think about this. Because when I talk to people afterwards, I find there's lots of excitement, um, uh, expectations, and uh, energy in to do more and take what we learn from here back to our own institution, home location, and apply it in the clinical practice, research activities, and so on. And I think this uh, meeting gave us uh, the materials or ammunitions that we can use uh, to advance our individual goals when we go back home. Well, I would say my overall impression is, is that it's been wonderful. <laughs> and exciting and I've really enjoyed the progression from uh, kind of the broad clinical overview all the way up to basic science because sometimes um, if we're not basic scientists as we are at this end of the table mostly um, we often you know we hear basic science and we don't see how is it relevant but today I felt like I, I was really getting, oh, here's the relevance of these mechanisms and feeding it back. So next steps for me is to really say, how can we have more of these interactions between basic scientists and those of us doing clinical work and also bringing in policy and translation and saying, how do we weave these webs more strongly going forward in the future? Because I think that ultimately leads to the multiple perspectives that help to move the science forward. I, I feel the energy and the love in this room. <laughs> and I feel like uh, this is a, such an invigorating place for ideas to intersect. Um, and it's a very special meeting in terms of, um, I feel like a region of part of my brain has never been stimulated, being stimulated. and. Uh, same is uh, typically we go to conference, meet the similar people, but this this really allows us to cross fertilize. Thank you. The the grant application and acceptance is in the mail for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm pitch hitting here, but um, I I have very much enjoyed this conference um, because on a similar thing. Different parts of my brain are, are working. I spend um, a lot of time in a um, cancer center treating people with lymphedema, but palpating a lot of things and trying to get people moving who aren't moving and trying to help people who are in pain. And so there's just all of these different pieces of my brain that 
are trying to figure out. At first, I was in panic mode going, oh my goodness, I've been having all these people get manual therapy, and is there any chance that that increased their metastases? And then I'm like, oh, no, it's okay. You know, <laughs> I didn't, you know, so, so I love that there's just been a lot of questions asked and um, a way to combine what you feel with your hands with the basic science. Sounds like, sounds like we need to do a functional MRI study right here, right now. <laughs> there will be definitely a positive study of the activation in the brains, right? Well, I think I can safely say this conference has been everything that we were dreaming it could be, uh, without any doubt. Uh, it's not over. I'm really curious to see what this panel will do. But, wow, um, I'm speechless. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I think it just, uh, um, I, I think that uh, what I was the most worried about that might not come through was that I was really concerned. I didn't want there to be a, a split between the clinical talks and the basic science talks. And I think that they were successfully blended and that the speakers made such an effort to talk um, use the, uh, language that was translatable. So I think it worked. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'll admit I, I, I was uh, very nervous because I, this is the first time I presented in a, in a conference sort of with this arrangement with so many different clinical and basic. And so I was concerned as a basic scientist um, how, how much uh, there would be basic science, but at least it, from this point over, I feel very comfortable. <laughs> I feel like somewhere in the middle I was supposed to be the transi transition, and here I am in the <laughs> middle of the table. Um, but uh, I, I, I learned a lot from the morning talks, especially because I'm so used to mechanisms, I'm so used to of signal transduction and, and things like this. Um, and especially with Beverly's presentation with lymphedema, and I've, I'm hearing a lot of uh, molecules that just are crossing over, and, and we didn't get into this in my presentation, but we've seen a lot of similar markers, TGF beta and other things as well. And so I think this is something neat that we can learn from each other, especially with some more of the mechanisms, but ultimately to design more of the basic research to be more translatable so that it, it can make more sense to the clinician and try to model our studies to um, mimic what's used clinically as much as possible, especially those of us who are doing the therapies and the animals, to be realistic. What can a clinician really accomplish? So if anything, it's given me some, some insight into that for experimental design. Well, I enjoyed this conference tremendously, um, and it really made me think about how, like, because I come from more of a, let's say, the traditional, like, molecular biology-driven world of medicine, where basic science is at the fundamental bottom where we find new, or we meaning scientists, let's say, find molecules or genes or proteins and then drugs are developed around those that target those. But I think it, this, what's nice about this is it's kind of teaching um, the opposite way, like that the, the clinicians and the physical, that the people who work with the patients should be informing the science. And this, I think, is what is what differentiates reductionistic kind of science from the integrative kind of science. And it's like almost in the opposite direction. And so I'm definitely going to be, you know, it's making me think about things in a lot different way. There's really not much left novel to say. So but <laughs> I know. <laughs> Uh, I do agree. So these, these short meetings from very different angles, one subject and three different, uh, let's say, disciplines is exactly where we should go. Uh, not, not generally you know, all the time, but, but every now and then, because that's where, where we get the ideas from. So when Susanna said um, that the clinicians often don't see where the molecular biology or the fundamental science has an application, uh, it's a myth that we on the fundamental side would know what the application would be. So we, we have to go to the clinical meeting and say, oh, wow, there's an application for what we're doing. Um, sometimes, sometimes you also start with the idea. And these meetings, they're just tremendously helpful to, to find that. Okay. So um, I've never been to a meeting like this before either, and um, uh, I'm just really struck by how many things the different groups can learn from one another and how much we have not been talking to one another. So um, I'm very thankful to, 
to Aline for putting this together, a very creative uh, sort of approach. And uh, it also makes me want to try some acupuncture, so. <laughs> For me, it's just starting. Um, the key speakers are hanging around for a day to explore um, various ideas, testable or not testable hypotheses, and that was done by a, a generous contribution for one of my patients. So after we had all the key speakers agree to come, I said, well, you know, we're all in Boston. Why don't we stay and shoot ideas around because things are going to come up. So it's kind of... If you build it, they will come. So we build it, Alain, and, and they've come. So we, we really appreciate questions and observations from the audience that we'll take into account as we're sitting and chatting over the next day. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Finley, Dr. Zick, and Dr. Langevin, and the organizations. I think uh, you've really set up a great meeting, and I think it is a beginning uh, for a nice, hopefully, continued collaboration. So there are two microphones on either aisle. Uh, I'm going to ask the first question. Now we'll get into some more serious uh, discussion and trying to look at some of the mechanisms of action. Uh, I was struck by Dr. Langevin's slide showing the acupuncture needle touching the fibers, touching the connective tissue, and dealing with the microenvironment. So as you think of that, and all the talks about today that we had about the microenvironment, micro and sometimes the macroenvironment, or what we're doing to the out bo outside body, how do you think some of the next steps of the research work that you are doing uh, might be affected in setting up some new protocols and what you might look for as far as mechanisms of action of massage, of acupuncture, of lymphedema massage. So an open question uh, to the panel. Who would like to start? Don't be aggressive now. <laughs> What's well, I mean, my first... My first thought is obviously lymphatics. Wow. I mean, as you said, is, um, in my lab, we spend a lot of time manipulating connective tissue around, but we've never had the lymphatics be part of the equation. So just after hearing the talks today, that, that's what springs to my mind, is that we have to integrate the lymphatic biology and the connective tissue biology. Well, that's what you know, Melody is doing so beautifully, but we have to just kind of now plug into that. I'll jump in and say, I'm also, you know, a big take home for me today was a, a lot about stiffness <laughs> in a lot of different ways. Yeah, um, you got to be careful there. Uh, so I'm, I'm really fascinated too by actually, we don't think about this, but the brain obviously makes a lot of chemicals that are inflammatory um, that actually then go into the systemic circulation and impact the microenvironment and the microenvironment can then go and potentially then impact the brain and this inner reaction and so I'm very fascinated to think about how are we having this interplay and what's the direction is it entirely always bi-directional or what is the one given the outcome that you're looking at that is more important so I, I'm, I'm very fascinated by that Part of it is um, I, I study integrated oncology. In conventional oncology, they're actually moving more and more towards traditional Chinese medicine called precision medicine, individualized treatment. I would challenge our field also move into that direction to really have the basic scientists to learn how we can manipulate connected tissue or lymphatic tissue in specific ways, as well as understand the fundamental ideology of whether it's joint, muscle, lymphatic issues, so we can have more targeted way to stimulate those points, whether it's by moxibustion by heat, electroacupuncture, or manual acupuncture. But in reality, in the clinical practice, as many acupuncturists here, we never apply one standard treatment for the entire population. But because we don't have those fundamental knowledge, we're really just doing it by empirical experience. 
I think I hope is my aspiration. We can be one day be mechanism driven in our delivery of intervention. And if we get there, I think the conventional world will accept us as part of the precision integrative oncology. Try again. I was, I was struck by, ah, there we go. Um, one of the things that I was struck by is that we, we think about things like diet and exercise, more, diet a lot as being something you can do to prevent heart disease, prevent cancer. And we don't think about these processes as something you can do to just have good well-being. And so I, I'm more, I, I'm coming away with this a bit more of, by the time you have cancer, you know, it's already too late. Why not do all this? You know, I, I, I feel like going back to my yoga class and like going more often and doing the things <laughs> that you should be doing to take care of yourself. And, and so it, it, it leaves me thinking that, that we really, as a society, maybe need to think about um, our overall well-being in a way that we, that modern medicine sometimes ignores. And we, we tend to be very into this or that target or this or that intervention. So, um, so I'm thinking of it more as how can we apply what uh, the, these sorts of physical approaches to enhancing our well-being. So I would, oh, sorry, okay, so can you hear me? No? Okay. I think somebody's mic, yeah, another <laughs> mic is still on. Everybody else has to turn it off or it's going to be So I, I think a, a little story would illustrate how I feel about yeah. this question, which is um, before I, at lunch, I had can you a try the other there you go. Okay, so at lunch I had a pretty... I was developing a bad migraine. And um, I was sort of getting my slides up there and, and a very, very kind and talented woman over there, Linda, um, told me that, oh, I'm a therapist, do you want me to work on you? And so we actually went upstairs. She spent at least 20 minutes or maybe 30 minutes uh, just pressing on certain points, and I never, you know, I never did acupuncture or acupressure. It, it actually works, I have to say. <laughs> my, my headache, no, my headache melted away, but I was still left with a little nausea, and then I sat next to a wonderful acupuncturist who started pressing on a part of my tibia, and my nausea went away. And I have to, no, I have to say, not only, this may, I really have been thinking, like, you know, we should be doing this, the, 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 you know, you guys know you have an intuition of, of medicine. And, and I think, like, tr like the, again, the traditional um, reductionistic approach is never going to get us to these points. And I, I feel like we need to be, like, studying these kinds of things, how they work. They work. So rather than trying to find a new drug out of a haste, you know, something that you, you have no idea exists and you try to find a receptor that binds to a molecule of the right shape or whatever, we should be looking at what what actually does work and using that to guide the basic science. And I don't think that we, we do it enough. I mean, I know that I, I definitely don't do it and I should. I, I study lymphatics, I should be doing it, you know. I know, I know massage work, so, yeah. <laughs> We'll, thank we'll you have very you very much both for curing me. Yeah. I really am grateful. We'll, we'll have you to be the poster woman for the Congress. <laughs> Anybody else from the panel? Uh, I like to, uh, talking about mechanism and the personalized care, I like to echo June's emphasis on how to tailor our therapy to patients who are most likely to respond. And uh, just last week or so, there was a very interesting paper published showing, you know, in Ayurvedic medicine, you design your treatment rem uh, remedy or the regimen based on the patient's body type, right? There are three different kind of type constitu constituents. And the group in India did genomic analysis of these people, and they were able to correlate certain kind of genomic polymorphism with a certain body type. And then they can actually predict based on without seeing the patients, and you just take some saliva, sequence the gene, and then you can predict you know, what kind of, uh, they like heat, they're more likely to be obese, and so on. And I think that shows uh, using very modern 
molecular biology, genomic technology showing some of the ancient wisdom that's been existing for thousands of years that people um, extracted from their empiric experience. And I think this is a very good direction to go because nowadays this genomic technology is very inexpensive. You can you can get a polymorphism study for a couple hundred dollars, and I think that's a very uh, exciting area of research uh, as a next step. Very good, very good panel. Uh, so we'll now go to the audience and start over there, uh, to my right, and then we'll go back over here to the left. Please oh. introduce yourself and try uh -huh. to make your question as briefly as possible, and if you want to direct it to the entire group or to a specific person, please note that. Okay. Uh, David Kravchek, um, I'm an acupuncturist uh, from Michigan. Um, I just wondered if I can talk about meridians, is that, I know there's a little bit of controversy, um, but I guess some of the work that's been done in South Korea uh, seems to indicate that they can actually stain the meridians, a, a thin tissue that's regularly transparent. I just wondered, um, it seems like they're doing a lot of work, um, you know, studying tissues, doing it a lot more, and I think, uh, has any of them thought about studying the, the tissue of the meridian and finding out, we know it's an electrical conductor, if it's ionic or if it's semiconductive, and about the, uh, how it can transmit and carry light energy. So, as a naive person mm -hmm. in this field, how do you know what's the meridian? What's that? How do you know? I mean, I, I could, oh. I'm sitting here thinking, well, I wonder if I could image it and I could see it. And, but how well, do you I know guess with this uh, stain, they were able to actually see it, and they believe it's a very thin uh, tissue that's transparent normally. That's why they can never see it when they're doing autopsies. So... How do you As an know acupuncturist, how, how, how would a pathologist tearing apart a body know? How would you know? As a um, pathologist? Well, because they can identify it where it's supposed to be, and that it's there. Just by location. Uh, well, location, location is one. Okay, so you could take you could take a piece of tissue and say this is from the location, and this is where the meridian should be, and then basic scientists like us could look at the structure for example, the collagen and the extracellular matrix and see is there a particular structure there that is associated with that meridian? That would be one I guess, way. Yeah. On that. So, yeah, that, in theory, that's a great idea, and people have tried that. The problem is always what, identifying what is not a meridian. <laughs> that's always the hard thing. And then whenever somebody would say, you know, okay, well, I'm going to go so many centimeters away from the meridian, and that's going to be not a meridian, uh, you know, you're going to have find people who are going to say, well, I come from the school of this or other, and we would put the meridian there, actually, not there. And there's just this real not uniform agreement. Yeah, it's very, yeah, it's very difficult to actually define a control location on the body that's not an acupuncture meridian. However, having said that, um, one of the works that, that my lab was done a long time ago is that we, we kind of looked at where acupuncture meridians in the books when they're described. They're usually described at places like, you know, in the groove between this muscle and that muscle or in the depression between the bone and the tendon. And those are places where there's, guess what? connective tissue, right? And that's also the places where the nerves are, the blood vessels are. So I think that, you know, obviously this is not a hard and fast rule, but these meridians tend to be located along, they call them channels, places where things kind of tend to collect. And so you can think about them that way, but there's, that's, there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, obviously, between connective tissue and meridians. So Very that's good. just the way we think about it. Next yes. question. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Matthew Bauer. I'm also an acupuncturist and president of the Acupuncture Now Foundation, a nonprofit educational organization. And <clears throat> when I think about integrative medicine, what I would like to see people have more awareness of is what I think is really, there are really two main approaches in, in medicine. One is, and especially very important in oncology, is where we try to attack a problem from the outside in with a, a, a for lack of a better term, man-made intervention to directly impact on a pathology. 
But another kind of approach, which is what acupuncture is entirely about, is try, we take some action, we do an intervention, but the goal of the intervention is not to directly impact the problem. The goal of the intervention is to somehow facilitate the way the body manages the problem. In other words, we're trying to cause positive reactions. We're trying to facilitate a, 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 a closer to optimal uh, effect of homeostasis. And I would just uh, encourage people to think that this is an entirely different subject matter for study and research. One is you're studying the direct impact, and then we hope that the body's reaction to that impact is not too negative as, as an adverse event. But here we're talking about the direct impact is not the therapy. The therapy comes from how the body reacts to it. And studying reactions is a vastly complicated thing, it's just like knowing who's going to get what side effect from what drug is a difficult thing to predict. You can take the same action and have tremendously varied reactions. Acupuncture is a type of reaction medicine. So that's, that's what I'd like to see in integrative medicine. We should be integrating the best of those both worlds, how we take direct action and how we try to help facilitate the body's own uh, efforts to manage itself. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments from the, I think there's agreement. Gary? Um, I, I think, yeah, that's exactly, actually in cancer therapy, we're doing that already. For example, androgen block it. Um, if you block uh, like Lupron, you don't really kill the prostate cancer cells, you block the production of androgen, which is served as an intermediate, and then you lead to the subsequent cases. But that is a very linear one-to-one -one reaction. I think acupuncture or some of the dietary changes, you get a variety of very complex changes that happen in the body. We may not even know the whole picture, but we probably know it's like a black box, but then we know the end results. So that's a very good point. Next question. Thank you all very much. I think Dr. Mao described having a feeling of love and, and excitement in this room, and I think we all feel that. So Patricia and Gary and, and Elen and, uh, and David, everyone who's been involved in this is just fabulous. And uh, I've been really struck that I spend a lot of, I'm, my name is Greg Plotnikoff, I'm a physician. I spend a lot of time in the basic science of um, gut issues, and I can't believe I've been attending conferences and intensive workshops on the immunology of the gut wall interface, and no one has talked about the lymphatics. Okay, <laughs> until today. <laughs> and particularly when we think about the, the um, this interaction, but talk about tolerogenic issues. Well, we have a zillion bacteria and archaea and other, you know, species, uh, other kingdoms present in our gut where we have to have an immune interface and a tolerance and a, of what's friendly and what's not. And I'm just kind of, wow, how did we miss this in other fields and how can we bridge that? And likewise, if, if people were doing abdominal or gut thrust, is that necessarily a good thing or are there times we need to be thinking about, well, that should not be done um, and would be contraindications um, to that because it if anything, a lot of us in this room would say gut health is the foundation of all health. Yes, and that was for me. Well, I'm, I think about <laughs> you and some of your neighbors, but. Because uh, uh, I also, I know she's published already, talked about this in some of her review articles, because I've read all her papers. Um, <laughs> but uh, we have actually done this with an irritable bowel model, just to let you know. We're finishing it, um, going through the last uh, path reports now and getting ready to publish this. Um, where we actually took the same uh, abdominal lymph pump in our rats and applied um, the therapy once a day for four minutes after the onset of an ulcerative colitis flare. There's an animal model that mimics ulcerative colitis. And in the, uh, in the group that received the uh, actual therapy compared to the sham therapy, which was just light touch with no compression, um, the, uh, the stool consistency was more solid. There was less blood and mucus in the stool. The animals um, did not lose as much weight, which is a, a, a common complication with colitis because of the dehydration and the diarrhea. Um, our paths, we're waiting to get our paths, our histopath um, 
report back to see at the tissue level if it changed anything. Um, and then sort of where we want to go now is we, we believe because with our previous publications where we've looked and cannulated the lymphatics and the mesentery and done these treatments, we show an immediate release of fluid in the mesentery, but also, um, I didn't talk about this data today, there's a big uh, mobilization of a lot of the inflammatory cytokines that seem to be naturally in the bowel, and these were in healthy animals. But they emptied into the lymphatics, and then we tracked them, and they, we could see them empty from the mesentery to the th thoracic duct, and then presumably they would be in circulation, where they would be, di be diluted. So we're wondering if, by doing the mesenteric manipulation in the bowel, we're actually relieving the um, uh, tissue of all those inflammatory mediators that get released during the chronic inflammation that maybe we're promoting the lymphatic uptake and redistribution. So we're now moving towards the second phase of the study to test that hypothesis. But certainly the, the fu GI function is paramount in immune tolerance. Um, and um, I'll, I'll probably hand this over to Melody because I know she knows a lot more about this than I do. No, I don't, but, um, <laughs> There is some, uh, some now some work finally being done in the, by the immunologists as well, looking at drainage, because all of your dietary lipid is taken up exclusively by lymphatics. And that, that's the interesting thing, because with food, um, tolerance is maintained in the liver. And so, you know, all of your food goes into the, into straight, straight into liver, that's what the liver does, but it, it promotes tolerance to food antigens. And I had the exact same question, well, what about all the bacterial product, like, you know, billions are turning over every day, and, and the bacterial um, cell walls are all lipids, so they must go in the lymphatics. And, and we are doing studies now to look and see if the mesenteric lymphatics are actually really important at um, pr promoting tolerance to to your bacteria in the gut. And interestingly, lymphatics have the molecule that helps to activate, that presents lipid antigens. It's called CD1, and they, they express it. And so we made a mouse where that's knocked out in lymphatics, and we're seeing if they can now like not make Oh, is this all being recorded? I'm going to get scooped now. It's okay. No, just kidding. <laughs> but we made a mouse that, that that's knocked out, and so we're seeing now if they cannot, you know, whether or not they can maintain tolerance to their bacteria. So we'll see. I'm so excited. I have to add on to that. Because when she started talking about that, I'm going to make it quick. We have pilot data. We're using healthy mesenteric lymph, and we're putting it in vitro into inflamed and injured cells, and our lymph that we collect from the mesentery of healthy animals is protecting in an inflamed situation. So we're actually moving towards that too. So we do think there's something very protective about at least healthy lymph. So you should be moving it around. Thank you for your question. <laughs> Great discussion today. I'm Norm Kettner, I'm a chiropractic physician. Uh, I have a comment and then a question. Uh, bioelectricity appears to be central to development, uh, regeneration, and probably cancer mechanisms as well. And I didn't hear very much discussion in the models uh, regarding that particular element. So I, I guess uh, I would encourage that researchers uh, explore models, for example, multicellular bioelectric net networks need to be identified uh, and their role needs to be explored uh, in the mechanisms uh, including cancer but tissue repair uh, as well. So I'd invite comments to that uh, point. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Finley? Okay. So, so we, we know for instance for bone that when you push on a bone in a certain way it remodels and traditionally that's thought of a bone as piezoelectric so it's conduction of electricity but it turns out when you look at the phenomenon much closer it's actually movement of fluid within the, the cells within the bone that's doing that it's not the piezoelectric so again that gets us back to movement of fluid lymphatic fluids as critical in in many processes that we thought were controlled by something else Pressing. Yeah, pressing. Oh, there we go. <laughs> the button, I mean. Um, so there's, there's a bit of 
literature in, in the skin field uh, of trans epithelial or well our epidermis uh, electrical gradients which gives positional information to the keratinocytes and tells them when there's a there's a wound how to migrate how to react and I'm not sure about the tumor field I don't know but but that's certainly something which is studied especially in the cell migration field it is um, one note, I just I want to apologize. I just took the microphone. I, I have to leave, so I have a flight going. So I just want to thank personally Helene for, for organizing this. It's just an awesome meeting. I think she, she can't get applause enough. So if you could just do that for her again. <laughs> <Good afternoon. laughs> it wasn't just me. <laughs> yes. Next I'm, question. I'm Natalie Schwer, University of Minnesota. So my question is mainly for the last panelists. Um, I found your presentation really interesting, thought-provoking. There are a couple things that I didn't really understand. One is it sounded like you're looking at the tension or softness in the local muscle area rather than, for instance, um, it just seems like if you're going to look at movement and cancer, it would be important to think about all the tension in the place that places more in the visceral area. You can get all kinds of tension patterns or adhesions, and those are usually the areas where the cancer would be more likely to occur. So that's one question. And two would be if you thought about um, more of an idea of relative stiffness, which is more of a concept from physical therapy, but so meaning that perhaps creating more tension in the legs, the hips, but being able to control that in a fluid way, you could actually create you know, less tension or let's say more resilience around the visceral areas. So I guess I'm, I'm like the, the drunk, drunk person who's looking for his keys under the, under the light, even though he lost them in, behind the garage. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking where there's some information. And yes, the body is a whole unit. But I got intrigued because muscle doesn't get cancer metastasis very much. So why is it so resistant? Muscle actually makes a small molecular um, product if you can filter out of a, of a muscle cell culture which will kill tumor cells. So the, the, the activating muscle may have protective effects elsewhere in the body, not just on the muscle. Uh, but, but yes, those are important things, um, not just fluid flow, but, but transmission of forces throughout different parts of the body. We just don't have good enough ways to measure uh, what they are, and, and research is usually limited by our ability to, A, to think of the problem, and B, to measure it. So. You, you, you've named a problem, now it's our job to figure out how do we measure it. Thank you. Over here now, on the left. Um, my name's Harris Frank, I'm an acupuncturist at Cancer Treatment Centers of America, and um, I'm a TCM acupuncturist, and I'm, um, all day I'm spent um, translating what you're doing into how I treat and how I look at the medicine that I, that I do with, with um, patients, and i um, struck by the stiffness as um, you know, primarily, well, you know, as a disease factor, which is something that we don't always consider. And the thing that um, I, I was actually texting with a um, acupuncture professor while while we, we, you were um, working, and I said, "Well, what causes stiffness?" And we we were thinking chi stagnation is one, but um, also a deficiency of yin. And without getting too much into what yin is, it's um, it's that which creates suppleness in the body. And um, there's two big ways that we look at at how you get to yin deficiency. One is blockage, and so all of the therapies that we're working with, acupuncture and manual therapies, are going to work to relieve a blockage somewhere in the system. But what we're not looking at is the other way you get yin deficiency is from there not being enough yin in the body to begin with, which is often nutritional. And so I thought, just kind of want to throw that out as something to consider, is that, well, what are we doing there in terms of how do we create suppleness in the body to begin with? Because the relieving a blockage when there is no blockage is not necessarily going to create more suppleness. And so I thought that was an interesting point. Anybody want to respond or about the environment um, and nutrition? I can, I can answer that. It's a great question. Um, one of the things, some of the molecules that I was talking about in my talk are derived from omega-3 fatty acids. And we just did a very, very small pilot experiment, which was just preliminary. I didn't present it, but we wanted to see if you tried to stretching these rats in the presence of a deficient diet. You know, rats where they did not get enough omega-3s, would it still work? And it, right now, our preliminary experiments, we did not work as well. 
So that's just a direction. I think in the relationship between the diet and the physical activity, the diet and the, you know, the manual therapies, whatever, it, the both need to be considered together. Another, another aspect of this is that um, you actually can get, you can, you can get cross-linking of the collagen, which stiffens it by um, what's called glycination, or so sugars can, can lead to cross-linking. And it's not entirely clear the relationship between dietary sugar and then this sort of cross-linking, but certainly I think in the next several years we're going to see a much greater understanding of how the nutritional uh, status and diet relates to the things we've been hearing about today in terms of the connective tissue structure. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. My name, <clears throat> my name is Lyudmila Vukolova, and I am a not a cancer researcher. Uh, I do research on Parkinson. Uh, you probably know that Parkinson and cancer have a lot of similarities, and um, such as stiffness change of the structural composition and body movement. So, and because I reached through my Parkinson's disease such an incredible results, I want to share it with you. So, during this lecture also, I, um, before the break, uh, I have written the note. And before I he heard the Dr. Schwartz, lecture, and I found that we do have some similarities in our approach. This is exactly what I want to present to you. Could you uh, ask a question? I think this is a good time for question and answer, so if you have a specific question for the panel. A uh, specific question. My question is that I have a view why we have uh, formation of the metastasis. This is my kind of point. And it's reinforced, really, your conclusion that there is a, I would like to share, I think it's important. Um, so if we are viewing cell as an integrity network system, then formation of nodes indicate a disruption of the integrity equilibrium on cellular, cellular level, and also structural deformation. Uh, removal of the node will change the structural composition, those creating unstable structural environment in the substrate and change dynamic of internal forces. So therefore, um, this condition will elicit an appropriate response on, and produce a structural rearrangement for stabilization. This distributed element and alignment and forming metastasis or migration of entities. This is what I have understood, all right, through the conce conceptualizing everything. And in reference to the stretching, uh, stretching done by Dr. Lengovin, uh, I see it, stretch what stretching does, it changes geometrical form. So it's elongate and so therefore it will be really, uh, uh, lead to restoration of conditioning for healing. This is what I see. And to validate my really ideas, you can see my work on restoration of tensegrity that produced significant result. But my the main port point that I did create a lot of methods and method methodology uh, that change the stiffness, uh, alter geometrical form structure, and change the behavior. So. I would love to share with someone if you are interested. This, this is, results are absolutely amazing through tensegrity equilibrium. Thank you. Next question. Hello. Hi, my name is Liz Bernstein. I am an acupuncture fellow at Beth Israel Hospital in New York. And I've been in the field for a long time. It's been over 20 years. And where we first started, we were either, we were a witchcraft or a cult. We finally got promoted to alternative medicine. And about, what, 20 years ago or so, we've, we got another promotion to complementary. And now I feel this, in, this forum has really uh, sanctified our place in integrative medicine. So to me, what the, you know, if I look at the, 
the collective conscious of a, 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 pre, of a, of a conference, conference like this is, is saying, hey, we've made it. You know, it's no longer if it works. It's the questions that were raised earlier as well, what can we do? So this is a comment and a question, and it may be not within the scope of this conference, but working in a hospital setting, what I'm seeing more and more on the macro level is that the hospitals are becoming conglomerates and that a lot of the money and the emphasis is shifting from primary care to tertiary care because there's more money in surgery and um, heroics. I'm just wondering how you as researchers, us as clinicians, can move the ball back to primary care and health care and disease prevention, how your research can inform policy. Well, as someone in the panel mentioned earlier, uh, we've come a long way, but we have a long way to go as yet. I think that uh, anybody in the panel wants to respond, but I think that integrative health, integrative medicine is certainly becoming more paramount and certainly placing a lot more emphasis on primary care. So my simple answer would be pay attention and vote. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I work at the Veterans Hospital in East Orange, which is uh, one of the four flagships for integrative medicine in the VA system in the country. And our director is 100% behind integrating these sorts of things into our care. So some places are leaders uh, in this. And actually, if you look at the VA system, most of the VA hospitals offer some kind of alternative medicine already. So. Uh, uh, the VA can be an instrument for change here. And, and isn't it amazing that we're sitting here at Harvard and there's an Institute for Integrative Medicine? I mean, I, exactly. I find that really inspiring. Susie? So as a, a person in primary care and family medicine, myself in June, um, I just want to say that Medicare and Medicaid wags the tail of all other insurance, right? And they create policy not directly themselves, but through Congress. So we all, all of our societies, whether they're clinician or research societies um, or professional societies, actually have to lobby and educate Medicare and Medicaid. It, if we do that, we can slowly but surely wag that dog. Thank you. Yes. Next question. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ryan Smith, and I'm an acupuncturist at NYU Perlmutter Cancer Center in New York City. And um, first of all, thank you so much for this conference because I've been inspired in so many ways by the connections I've made and um, by new ways of thinking about doing research. And so I think my question is for Dr. Langevin. I'm looking at um, how to treat neck fibrosis in head and neck cancer patients because in that population, uh, not only surgery figures prominently, but also radiation. And um, one of the things that I was really inspired by are some of the um, mechanism studies that we've seen. And I'm just curious, um, based on your previous work at looking at connective tissue, if you've ever used a sonogram to look at fibrotic tissue to see if it's changed after needling or during needling, or if you have any thoughts about looking at fibrotic tissue, not just in terms of patient reported outcomes or range of motion or palpation, but in terms of actually looking at the tissue. Yes, the answer is yes, but my mic isn't working. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, we have. And um, actually, Robert Davis is here in the audience someplace. <laughs> Robert, uh, as Robert and I have been working for a long time uh, on trying to really quantify using, you know, robotic devices and sort of very sensitive torque sensors and to measure the amount of force that is exerted onto the needle by tissues that is uh, more or less diseased. Fibrosis is, was an obvious one. We looked at patients with scleroderma, which is a good example mm -hmm. of fibrosis. The force on the torque was much, much, much higher than in uh, you know people, normal people. We we had a very strong interest in radiation fibrosis, uh, especially after head and neck cancer and, and breast cancer. 
we were unfortunately not able to get funded, SNF, <laughs> uh, to do that, but somebody sh needs to do it. Uh, I think it's important that it gets looked at because it could be an indicator of what's going on, especially now that we're figuring out that, that the, the, the stroma, you know, is so, and the nice thing about acupuncture needles is they're small. You're not going in there with a shovel, you know. You you can you can really and you know I've I've watched people who are very very excellent in their needle technique who do acupuncture needling under ultrasound guidance, and they're using this tick these needles as little sort of micro manipulators almost, and I think it would be really neat. As a matter of fact, I was talking thinking of talking with you, Patricia, about that about looking at that in your sort of highways. <laughs> Thank you. Next question. Yeah, hi, my name is Kathleen Kressler. I'm a neurologist. I recently became an acupuncturist. And because in medicine we train first in science and then in clinical stuff, and now the buzzword is every, the data has to be robust. It has to be robust. And a lot of the acupuncture studies are small studies. So I'm wondering if you can comment, since most of you seem to be scientists, um, on the legitimacy of meta-analysis for drawing conclusions about treatment efficacy. And I say that because I imagine myself giving a grand rounds to the most resistant MDs and trying to convince them that this is a legitimate treatment because I found it so, so powerful in my own patients. Good question. Gary, or? Well, well um, I think uh, meta-analysis meta is just a type of research method basically synthesize the original trial data using, um, uh, when possible, using statistical sort of uh, tools. If you can, you can perform a systematic analysis. The biggest challenging thing about meta-analysis, if the original trial is poorly designed, there's no amount of meta-analysis you can make it better. So when we teach students about epidemiology, it's garbage in and garbage out. If you try to package garbage, it's just going to be a gigantic ball of compacted garbage. <laughs> so, so that's why it is important to do the good original trial. If there are good original trials, then you can do meta-analysis to enhance the ability to draw more bigger conclusions. I think one a good example is the acupuncture trialist groups. I think a lot of people are here. It's done by large US and European trials and then create a 17 to 18,000 individual patient level meta-analysis. Actually for type of meta-analysis, this is actually leading the way even for conventional medicine in how the meta-analysis is done. One of the things is um, my daily life for the last 12 years have been battling the critics. So, you know, Pennsylvania is the oldest medical school in the U.S. So the goal is not to really, in medicine actually, healthy skepticism is a good thing. So I wouldn't view people who are somewhat have a different opinion because, uh, because in reality, nobody agrees with everybody in medicine even in standard care. So I would just, uh, you know, a lot of time I do feel like as acupuncturist or as a massage therapist, sometimes we feel like we somehow are a bit inferior than those people. I think we need to just get rid of that thoughts. And I think <laughs> I'm just presenting the fact you can choose to accept it, you can choose to disagree with it. Ultimately, if you serve the patient better, that's what counts. And if I could add one thing, and I'm not a clinician, as you all know, but um, I think it's kind of preposterous for us to be asking for proof that something that's like 2,000 years old works because you have 2,000 years of clinical trials, right? I mean, I mean, history, it wouldn't be still in use if it didn't work. So I think instead we should be trying to research not if it works, but like how it works. Like we should just be focused on that, not if it works. Anyway. <laughs> I think we'll go another five minutes. I know our time is up, so if just the four next, next four people, two in each row. Next. Uh, an acupuncturist, and um, my question is doctor, for Dr. Langevin. I'm wondering if you've ever looked at um, 
you've shown that you, you make a wound in the back, you stretch the back, the infl inflammation is reduced. I'm wondering if you've ever looked at putting a wound in the back and stretching limbs and seeing if that makes a difference, um, or putting a wound in the limb and stretching the back. Uh, we haven't done that, but it's a very good idea because there could certainly be uh, hormonal type substances, for example, myokines, right? It's a great example of, of something that the muscle secretes and then goes, gets into the bloodstream and has effects elsewhere. So yeah, it's absolutely possible, but we haven't done it, so good idea. Question? Uh, hello, my name is John McDonald uh, from Griffith University in Queensland, Australia. I've been an acupuncturist for 44 years, a researcher for six. The area of my research has been anti-inflammatory mechanisms of acupuncture in allergy. And the reason I'm doing that is because my question since 1971 has been, how does this stuff work? And that's, that's been something I passionately want to know. I'm greatly encouraged by the emphasis not only of the conference, but also of the funding priorities about mechanism. Because when you tell people how it works, they forget to ask you if it works. Now, one thing I've noticed, I've been looking at that slide, I've been listening to, to talk of symptom clusters, and I'm going, I know that cluster, I've seen it before. Fatigue, sleep disturbance, immune dysfunction, GI dysfunction, cognitive dysfunction, mood dysfunction, body clock disruption. Body clock disruption has been shown to be a significant uh, increase of risk factors for cancer. If that's the case, might it not be that people with cancer might have body clock disruption. If they did, they would be fatigued in the day and unable to sleep at night. They would have immune dysfunction, they would have GI dysfunction, they would have difficulty thinking clearly, and they would have mood disorders. Now that's a really easy hypothesis to test, because if that's the case, all, they ha all you have to do is test, do they have high melatonin during the day, which is why they can't get motivated and move, because the fatigue is caused by the body trying to sleep, and in the night, they can't sleep because the melatonin is low. So I'd just like to throw that out there. If anyone's looking for a hypothesis to test, high melatonin in the day, low melatonin in the, at night, and then that links body clock in as a, a, a unifying factor in that whole symptom cluster. So there's, a, there's a, a free kick for somebody who's looking for a question. I can't do it myself because I'm busy with my own research in another area, but I would so love to see somebody researching that question. Sort of, sort of related, um, I'm working with somebody who works on sleep apnea and brought us in to look at whether that then changes fibrosis and inflammation. And the hypothesis is that you have transient hypoxia, which drives inflammation. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really um, makes a lot of sense that they're all related. So. Yeah. That person sounds pretty messed up, right? <laughs> Actually, it's a very common problem. I would say maybe half of the population have this kind of non-sick but not well condition. Uh, it's, there is a condition called the sick behavior, sick, sick cluster. I think uh, there's a guy at uh, Dr. Cleveland in, at MD Anderson did a lot of work on that. And I think the working hypothesis is uh, it all boils down to a high circulating pro-inflammatory cytokines in the body that create all these clusters. Who creates what, who is the cause, we don't know, but uh, they kind of cluster together. Next question. Yeah, thank you for the great work you're doing. I think this is truly a historic moment for integrative medicine today to have all of you here. My, um, my background is I'm an oncology nurse and a researcher in integrative medicine, and I feel that I live, live in two worlds. My question for you is, if you have practical suggestions or ideas that we, each one of us can do to increase access and awareness of this wonderful knowledge to our patients and to other healthcare professionals, because I find that 95% of my colleagues or my patients don't know about this great work. <laughs> Dr. Finley? Uh, well, this conference has been recorded, and Helen Lozman <laughs> will is going to make all of the lectures publicly available, so you can encourage and, and you know, turn the recording on and show portions or all of it. You can also play it back and slow it down to about 80 <laughs> percent speed. <laughs> Okay, um, 
dot org, okay, is our website. That's what one of the main goals of the Osher Center is to do things like bringing people together just like we did today. And we're going to, on our website is where the videos will be. So, thank you. First of all, First of all, I want to thank you. Um, oncology nurse is probably one of our biggest friend for integrated oncology. Because you are at the forefront for symptom management and wellness. You are in conventional oncology, and you have more time interacting with the patient than actually the doctors. So thank you for coming. Then next question is to ask. At SIO, we looked, there's over 100 cancer centers in the United States alone, let alone in the rest of the world. Only 37 of them have a member in SIO. How can we get to 100%, right? Even in one cancer center have one member. Then the question is, how can you drag a friend into the society? <laughs> I have to say, if it's not my friend Kevin Matthews, maybe still here, dragged me into SIO, my research might have taken a very different directions. So I think there's this art of serendipity, and there is sort of a power of persuasion. So I encourage you to do both. Thank you. Robert Schleif, uh, Ulm University. My question is about hyaluronan and how it may be involved in the stiffness regulation. We learned from the stakeholders that it may make a difference uh, whether the stiffness comes from the fibers, then it's called fibrosis, or whether the stiffness comes from the change in the ground substance. And one way the ground substance may be influenced is by hyaluronan. And is that involved in any of the stiffening that you have been observing? and can be influenced with stretching or with exercise. So a few things about uh, hyaluronin. Um, so the former postdoc who did a lot of the work um, that I showed today, the basis of it, Paolo Provenzano, went on to look at pancreatic cancer, which has a lot of fibrosis, found that if you degrade hyaluronin with hyaluronidase, you can actually get chemotherapy, chemotherapy into the pancreas better. So the problem with pancreatic cancer is that it's so fibrotic and so stiff that the drugs don't get into it. Now, um, could we somehow take that information and use it in this context in terms of manipulating or acupuncture or something? I don't know, because I don't know that area. But, um, but that's something about hyaluron. And the other thing is that there's something called vascular mimicry, where tumor cells actually line fake blood vessels to help get uh, blood supply to the tumor and part of what they do is they coat themselves with hyaluronic acid and that prevents them that that helps create this this fake blood vessel that works as a blood vessel and then the last thing is that hyaluronin is implicated in metastasis and one of the genes we see go up in the tumor cells when they're in a stiff environment is the receptor for hyaluronic acid so that receptor allows the cells to migrate more and invade more. So it's definitely involved. Now how do we use that for you know, acupressure, acupuncture, um, other forms of approach, chiropractic, I don't know. <laughs> I just know it's there and it's important. Very good, well I think this has been an incredible day. I think we need a round of applause for all our speakers in the panel today. Um, don't go anywhere. Okay, I think I want to make sure that we have a chance to acknowledge uh, some of the wonderful people who have made this conference possible, who've organized and, or and orchestrated everything. And the first one is our program manager, Adara Nusrat. Adara, come on here. <laughs> Adara 
Canada has done not, you can imagine, I just want to say something, this is really important. To try to organize a conference like this with three societies and actually make it work with no fighting, arguments, problems, I mean really, and, and, like and well, Helen no, but, as well. Helen. you know, and I want to also, really, and this is also because the leadership of the three organizations were unbelievably collegial and helpful and, and we really work together. So I want to have uh, the people come to the front. So unfortunately, Libby Eason from the uh, Fascia Research Society is not here, but she was, she's been unbelievable. Laura Triplett from SAR. Is Laura here? Where is Laura? And we have uh, Vicky Charbonneau, Beth Kruger, Sarah Reagan, and Carrie Renouart, who are still here, some, some of them. Anyway, f from and And then I want also importantly want to mention, excuse me, besides Vitaly Napado, Tom Finley, and Susie Zick, who were on the phone call, Patty Arkari, who I know is here, who really contributed a lot to the uh, organization and planning and everything. Come on. <laughs> and uh, yes. <laughs> Come on, Patty. So um, we're going to take some pictures here with the speakers. <laughs> Meanwhile, please go and enjoy the, um, the, uh, the posters. I also want to echo the, the, one of the last comments that were made. Joining these societies is really important. You have an opportunity here to you have three societies. Pick which one you want, but you don't have to join just one. You can join more than one. Uh -huh. Get involved. And, and really spread the word. I mean, this, this is really important. That's what these societies are for. And uh, make, you know, please make full advantage of the rest of the time that we have here until over we have until over wine and cheese. And uh, we have, of course, if you have not, some posters you haven't seen yet, but please uh, get to meet people that you haven't yet met and look for people who are from a society that you're not part of. Thank you all for coming.